You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Attention pharmacy owners. Did you know you could be missing out on extra customers simply because they don't know what products you stock and where you are located? Pointy solves this problem by getting all your in-store products online and found in local searches. Using Pointy is simple. Connect a small device to your point of sale and as you scan products, they are automatically uploaded to your personalized Pointy page. When people search online for your products you stock, your store appears with better results, product details, and clear directions to your pharmacy's address. It's one of the reasons Forbes calls Pointy a game changer for businesses. Listeners to this podcast episode can sign up with Pointy for a one-time investment of $349 instead of $499 with no yearly, monthly, or maintenance fees and a full 90-day money-back guarantee. Visit us now. Go to pointy.com forward slash PPN to learn more about Pointy and sell more of your in-pharmacy store products. That's pointy.com forward slash PPN. Today, we live at a unique point in human history where data is becoming the new currency. Beyond oil, dollars, and social status, data is emerging as one of the most powerful and consequential currencies around the globe. Technology, computer processing, cloud storage, and artificial intelligence are empowering these data to transform zeros and ones into insightful and even profound realizations about almost every aspect of our lives. I'm John Nasta. And this is FutureDose.Tech with your hosts, Dr. Timothy Ungst and Megan Chilcott. Technology, pharmacy, and better healthcare delivery by creating more efficient, higher quality concierge-like pharmacist services, we can transform from the pharmacist of yesterday into the future provider of pharmacy tomorrow. FutureDose.Tech is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, the global leader in pharmacy podcasting and the largest, most influential network of podcasts about the profession and business of pharmacy. Greetings, this is Dr. Timothy Youngst, uh, founder of the Digital Apothecary and the co-host of FutureDose.Tech and also a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. So today I'm going to give a quick talk about something that's been really something I've been trying to get more passionate about because I think it's really important for the pharmacy profession just based on the sheer amount of literature now coming out and almost a stabilization of the field overall. So as most of you guys know, I'm really big into digital health and it's one of my biggest passions. Depending on who you ask, digital health can be divided into different sectors. And there's different people who will define digital health depending on what industry they worked within. So startups may say one thing, academics may say another. And I would say there's really no firm definition out there at this current time. Nonetheless, probably one of the best things to fall back onto would be the FDA, since they are the regulatory body in the United States. And they've been kind of looking at the digital health space as it's been maturing and been saying a lot more about it and, you know, making some more regulations around that field. So if we look at it from that perspective and go with the FDA, well, what do they qualify as digital health products? Some of them include mobile medical applications, And that has its own little framework. And then you have wearable devices, such as, as I've talked about uh, before with the Apple Watch and doing EKG measurements that falls under their jurisdiction. You also have EHRs, telemedicine, IT infrastructure. And the one thing, though, that's coming up, though, that is breaking into its own kind of body is basically digital therapeutics. And digital therapeutics is a new subset of digital health that really has been maturing a lot, I would say, and has kind of turned into a field that's been gravitating a lot of attention across different areas. Um, So if you listen to my last podcast about uh, the American Medical Association talking about digital health and remote patient monitoring, this kind of also falls under the same jurisdiction because these are products that could possibly be used um, by physicians, pharmacists, and others. So why am I talking about this now? Well, one thing is there's an organization called the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, and they are an organization that has been working steadfastly with 
different uh, digital therapeutic companies trying to get them more mainstream, I guess you could say, and helping them get more recognition. And they recently released an industry report that had a lot of say about the digital therapeutics market. And one of the things that I thought was really cool was it actually has um, kind of definition out there about digital therapeutics, which I'm going to read off now, and I think it's probably one of the best I've seen. So digital therapeutics deliver evidence-based therapeutic interventions to patients that are driven by high-quality software programs to prevent, manage, or treat medical disorder or disease. They are used independently or in concert with medications, devices, or other therapies to optimize patient care and health outcomes. Digital therapeutic products incorporate advanced technology best practices related to design, clinical validation, usability, and data security. They are reviewed and cleared or approved by regulatory bodies as required to support product claims regarding risk, efficacy, and intended use. And digital therapeutics empower patients, healthcare providers, and payers with intelligent and accessible tools for addressing a wide range of conditions through high-quality, safe, and effective data-driven interventions. A little wordy, but I think that's the best that can be done at this current time because you're not going to get really one-sentence terms that define an area that is quickly changing day-to-day. So their definition kind of is basically going to evolve, I think, over time, but for now is a pretty good framework. If you had to look at this, though, I would say some key takeaway points. One of them would be the fact that digital therapies, or if you had to make a checklist, they have to be software-based. So it's not like a wearable device on its own. So if you were to look at the Apple Watch, that's not really a digital therapeutic product per se. It's, it's, it does something, it can identify a problem, but it's not leading to any kind of outcome. So it has to be software based. It can it can be cross platform. It can integrate with other devices and such within it, but it also has to be evidence based. So it has to have some kind of literature saying that it's going to accomplish some kind of solution or some kind of outcome for disease management. It has to be regulated, and it also has to be able to be integrated with uh, different data points. So digital therapies. I mean, like you know, if you're a pharmacist listening. This is not very different than, say, you know, sitting in class for all those years listening to pharmacotherapy. I mean, if you went through, if you have a PharmD and you've gone through training in the past decade plus, you've had pharmacotherapeutics, usually about two years worth. And, you know, it's disease oriented by system based classification, talking about drug therapy and treatment based on the best guidelines at the current time that, as we have noticed, have changed over many years. So, Digital therapies kind of just is very similar to that kind of process. What you have is you have digital solutions that are therapeutic in nature. So it's not surprising that we see digital therapeutics, even by its definition and language, very mimicking like drugs. If we're talking about it, it's software based, but it's, drugs would be like oral, injectable, but some kind of mechanism getting to the body. It has to have some kind of evidence supporting its use. You know, we talk about safety, and that's always a big concern, but also risk efficacy, and does it actually lead to a certain therapeutic outcome that indicates its use, uh, proper utilization? And then regulation is very similar. I mean, we obviously want a product that's saying that it can accomplish any of these things to have some kind of regulation by a body saying that and supports it. So what sets them apart a little bit more differently, though, would probably be the integration of software capabilities, because this opens up a different data set in terms of knowledge it's not just, okay, now you have to know the disease and how that works. You not only have to know the mechanism action of this software, but you also have to know almost like tech support and things like that. And I guess you could call it like the equivalent of monitoring parameters or safety and, uh, safety and adverse events in terms of the stuff failing. But that's something that is probably at this time me just saying like these are things I could probably pick out and make it as similar to what we know in pharmacy at this current time. So why do I care about digital therapeutics? Well, I I would argue the big thing for me is the fact that this is a new clinical therapeutic area that's going to expand relatively quickly. And I think as digital therapeutics come onto the market, what we'll actually see is in order to get more exposure and to get more attention, they're going to have to team up with people. And obviously, probably the number one industry to team up with at this current time would be pharma. As I said before, pharma is always trying to think beyond the fill. And if they're thinking beyond the fill, they're turning towards tech. So digital therapeutics kind of falls within their pipeline. They already have experts targeting certain clinical diseases. And to have a digital product that can be thrown on top of it, and perhaps even in conjunction 
with a pharmacotherapy that they're already offering kind of is, you know, two birds with one stone and gives them more of a oomph in terms of how much they can offer. So what are some examples? Probably the one that has the biggest um, press as of late, I would say, that has gotten a lot of attention would be paratherapeutics. So paratherapeutics has been teamed up with, um, as a sponsor with uh, Sandoz, which is a subsidiary of Novartis, and they have a few FDA-approved apps platforms out there already. One of the best ones right now is known as Reset, and it's used to treat substance use disorders um, along with commercial uh, products. And that one has been a huge thing that Novartis has been investing a lot of time into because with a lot of the products in the pipeline for here, it kind of makes sense. And paratherapeutics exploring other areas such as opioid use disorder, which kind of makes sense with the opioid epidemic we are facing in the United States. Everyone's trying to get in there, so go for it. But then we're also seeing other touch points such as insomnia, depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy, and Parkinson's disease. And it's kind of interesting because you look at these diseases and it's almost like health and wellness. It's a, a lot of that's a lot of uh, subjective data that can be captured from patients, but also limited objective data as well. So turning towards a digital therapeutics to help out with this management kind of makes sense. Some other ones that are tied towards more drugs, though, that might make more... Um, directed impact of how digital might ther- therapies might work in the pharmacy field would be Propeller Health and Adherium. So Propeller Health and Adherium with uh, the new OTC line in the United States called Haley, basically they're creating smart sensors that attach to inhalers that can track adherence. And they have a lot of evidence showing that this actually may increase adherence, Or, but the reality is it also helps out in terms of monitoring the diseases. So if you think about if you have a patient on a SABA, and they have COPD or asthma, and they start using their saba more frequently, we could probably deduce that there's something going on with that disease that needs to be more closely monitored. And some organizations have actually started integrating this. Express Scripts is probably one of the ones that have caught that pop up to mind because I've seen that they have a pharmacy team over there that are actually monitoring high-risk patients with pulmonary diseases using SABAs, and they're using Propeller Health basically to help monitor these patients and deduce whether or not they're high risk and intervene before they have to be hospitalized or have an exacerbation. Then you have Insulia that's created by Volantis, and this is an app platform that works with patients with diabetes on a long-acting insulin analog. So what this thing does basically is it helps the patient understand what dose of this long-acting insulin to use for the management of uh, their therapy. And it actually has some evidence that it can lower A1C. And it's kind of cool because if you think about it, you have this app that a provider can use to integrate to help look at blood levels of glucose and also how is a patient living, what's their lifestyle and such like that. And they could also give insights, hey, you should buy increase or decrease your dose at this time instead of you know waiting for a person to call in or come into the office for such uh, monitoring. So we're getting real-world em- impact here and we're getting real-world uh, interventions. Similarly is like Blue Star, which is created by Welldoc. It's a type 2 diabetes management platform. And it takes more like what I would say is a holistic kind of outlook. It's not really just drug tied, um, though it does help out with management of medications. It also looks at the diabetes care plan that would be initiated by a physician. And it will also look at uh, diet, exercise, and psychosocial well-being that it could monitor these things and also determine whether or not these are being met to help out with uh, diabetes management. So, you know, these these platforms I'm talking about in themselves can be tied with the therapy. They can be used standalone, um, but they're really also being used by a clinician to help out with with guiding clinical practice. So in their way, they're a therapeutic intervention that can help lead to some kind of disease management. So whether it be substance use disorder, whether it be diabetes or cardiometabolic syndromes or pulmonary disease, this is the stuff that I think a lot of companies are trying to get into. And I would suspect that most of the biggest hit areas are psychological at this current time, um, along with um, cardiometabolic, because those are probably the two of the biggest areas that are really hotly talked about in the digital marketplace at this current time. One area that I haven't seen as hit as strongly would be ID, but that might be an area that might change in, in the future at some point. So going further along, what would it take to expand digital therapeutics beyond what it's currently at? So we have different organizations that are trying to get them out, uh, different, uh, and there's different regulators trying to define this 
area of digital health and how to use it. But I would say there's probably four things that I think is need to be overcome. One is legislative backing. So there needs to be more push from the federal level in order to define digital therapeutics and how it falls into play and what regulations need to be utilized. You know, and along with that, then is what monitoring has to go into it, into it. For any drug in a market, for instance, if there's any adverse events or stuff noted, there's ways to report it. So where does that happen with digital therapeutics, for instance? If a company is collecting all this data, which they have more touch points in, with a drug, then how would you go about saying, well, you know, at this point or with these issues, this is where you have to redo the product? Cultural acceptance is probably one of the biggest things I would say. Um, most patients these days attach that there is some kind of therapeutic intervention that you have to do um, with a drug or with a surgical procedure. Not that, oh, if I use this system or if I answer these questionnaires or if I carry my smartphone around and do certain things that it may help me with my disease. And that is a really tough area. Now, if you think back to what I talked about previously in my podcast about the AMA uh, digital health uh, implementation plan, one of the things that the AMA had recommended with remote patient monitoring was not to roll it out for every patient, but to identify patients likely to succeed. And I think that goes back with this cultural acceptance. I don't think the baby boomers are going to be the biggest population for this. I think it's going to be Generation X and Millennials at some point, which may also explain the emphasis on cardiometabolic and not just cardiac because we're getting older and along with that on psychological and health and well-being. Um, so we're more likely as a generation to probably accept the stuff and use it. And I could see at some point it having a huge selling point because you think about in pharmacy, we have so many patients asking, can I get off this drug? Do I need to take this? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, well, maybe you don't need it, but, you know, you have to do X, Y, Z, and this goes beyond my scope that I can easily do. I mean, yes, I can talk about diet and wellness and exercise, but, you know, creating a, a plan, monitoring and such doesn't really work too easily in my favor. So if I could prescribe something they could do it, then that might be the best case scenario, or at least recommend them and nudge them to a program. And then maybe they could get off of medication at some point because of that. So the um, next thing would be payer integration. Payers is going to be a key thing. Just like we talk about drugs with PBMs and reimbursement models, um, and I know that's a sour point for some of you guys out there. I'm not going to get into that. You can listen to the other podcast um, on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. But in any event, um, payer integration is probably key here because you need to have someone backing us up. You know, who is an insurance company going to say, yes, I, if my patient has a high risk for cardiometabolic problems, I want them to be on this system or platform or app, and I'm willing to pay for it and cover the subscription of whether service for this patient, then that would probably give companies who are getting into digital, digital therapeutics a little bit, well, the boost that they need. At this current time, a lot of relying on subscription models or one-time payments, um, and I think those are more likely to fail than those that can be integrated into a payer-based model where they actually would get you know, this financial support that they ultimately need, just like any pharma organization at the end of the day. Next would be, and lastly, what I think is the biggest thing would be clinical integration. And what I mean by that is we have so many guidelines that we used uh, for evidence-based care, and yes, guidelines are not, you know, a, a not something that applies to every exact patient, but just as they are, they, they help guide patient care in the best with using the best support or evidence at this current time. So one of the things that the things I think that might make the biggest difference is if we have a guideline that starts integrating digital therapeutics into it, saying, you know, expert level, blah, uh, category, whatever. Um, we recommend highly that this patient, if you have a patient with XYZ, should be on a digital therapeutics X. You know, something like that. I think the minute that happens is going to be the paradigm shift that we see in clinical practice, whereby digital therapeutics have made it big because now we have basically this shift towards not just talking about drugs uh, and therapies and when to put them in and also diagnosis and wellness and monitoring, blah, blah, blah. But we also have now a a technological side to it. And I think that's going to be quite fascinating when we start seeing guidelines integrate those. And I would probably say that's probably going to be a big push at some point here, seeing that come about. So, you know, why do I care about this as a pharmacist? And why do I think this is a pharmacy related topic? Um, one of the biggest catches right now with digital therapeutics is there's no firm language saying who can prescribe this thing. 
So I think that we'll eventually get to the point where pharmacists can build for remote patient monitoring. Along with that will probably be the need for some digital endpoints in terms of tools to use. So we have a lot of this stuff for medication adherence we can monitor, but I think digital therapeutics may also be a tool that could be also integrated into the level of where pharmacists can use another product for patient care. And you know, when I look at digital therapeutics, the language and such very much mimics currently the same thing with pharmacotherapy. It's the same idea as dispensing and everything else um, product for an endpoint, except it's a little bit more clinical in terms of um, what information you're getting out of it, which I think is quite fascinating. That being the case, though, digital therapeutics also comes with a caveat that it's definitely a different information set in terms of the tech side. So when we're talking about data, when we're talking about how these clinical trials are being done to validate the solutions, I think it's a little bit different. I don't think anyone has really addressed completely the whole educational component of integrating digital therapeutics into anyone in medicine about you know how to consider it. And I think it's probably one of the biggest shortcomings in the digital therapeutic space is, is as it gets bigger, we're going to have to think about you know how do you... You know, where does this fall in training? Where does this fall under uh, engagement? Where does this fall under exposure for students, residents, and anyone else? But I do think this is something that we're going to see pop up, especially as I mentioned previously, a lot of these digital therapeutic products are going to be aimed at drug therapy concurrently at this current time, just because they're going to try teaming with some kind of pharma space to make their product big. In any event, this is uh, Timothy Young's founder of Digital Apothecary and part of the um, Future Dose Podcast, and if you have any questions, feel free to tweet out at me at TDYoungs on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn or visit my website at thedigitalapothecary.com. Take care and have a happy holiday. Thank you for listening to FutureDose.tech. If you enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast on your favorite social media outlets. Be sure to stay connected to the Pharmacy Podcast Network and return for your next FutureDose.tech episode coming soon.